The most common mistake that I see as a chess coach is that people give away time, tempi. And uh, while they are have learned to be very stingy with material, they freely give away time. And of course, they always have some kind of narrative you know, in their mind as to why they're giving away the time, but they don't feel in their heart why it's so special, this thing, this time that they have. And mostly because they haven't faced a level of opposition yet who has punished them for their loss of time. Now, of course, when people ask me, how do I improve? I almost always say, look at your own games. And uh, I think if especially class players look at their games, they will see that the most kind of common kind of mistake is that they lose time. So what I'm going to do is show you a game where a chess improver named Say Chess, who has a blog, Twitter, really going for it, studying a lot of tactics, doing a lot of opening study, uh, where I think every critical mistake that he makes in this game, or most anyway, are all mistakes of time. And so that's why I think it is the simplest and easiest way to become a stronger player is just to become more sensitive to time. And that most people struggling between 1200 and 2200 don't feel how uh, important time is. So you can watch this analysis and uh, maybe even disagree with my assessment that it's mostly to do with time, but that's how I saw this game. Say chess, we're coming to you, buddy. I'm going to be mean to you, but uh, our friend Vishnu, who couldn't join us today, he has called me the tempo fiend. And as I'll just note here, we've got two uh, games on tempo here. And, you know, one thing about me being a tempo fiend, especially as a coach, is uh, it is so easy to stop giving away time. Um, I've taught people who knew nothing about chess and they were able to play better openings than most 16, 1700s immediately just because they, they, uh, whenever they moved a developed piece twice or lost a tempo, I would slap them, you know? I'd slap them. And like I said, I'm usually not a mean coach, but I feel like if you have that ingrained in your mind of not losing time, it's already such a huge advantage for your chess. Okay, so here we go. Um, F3, interesting. And bishop e3, let's call that the old move. Uh, bishop g5 is kind of the new move. But bishop e3, honestly... Um, I kind of, what I like about it is the following, is that the reason bishop e3 is not uh, that highly uh, appreciated is because of c5. And that's what happens in this game. And the point is, is that if d5 and e6, we're going to get a Benoni where the bishop is a little insecure on e3 and arguably miss, you know, not doesn't know where it's do doing on bishop e3. Okay, that's my understanding anyway. And that, this position is full compensation for uh, black with, say, knight c6 and then the intention of knight d7. And my only word to the wise here is that uh, Black players will simply have this in the back of their mind and won't have studied it that intently. If you turn on the engine and look at some classical games in this position and just understand some of the basic ideas, the main one of which is how is black going to deal with knight d5 and how do you develop your pieces? Um, the position is equal, but you will have an incredible... Uh, advantage in this ending going forward if you just understand some of the ideas going forward from the white side. Okay, so knight g2, let's call that an inaccuracy because after cd, which is played, uh, after knight d4 now, white uh, is, well, that's about an equal position, Maroxy bind, we've transposed where the f3 a pawn isn't so special, but sure, we could have done this. 
All right, now the first time I'm going to yell at say chess here, bishop d4, and my sense is right that you didn't appreciate that, the, first of all, that dark square bishop is your best piece by all means, and so you're absolutely right that probably now you've got to lose another tempo going back bishop e3. Okay, so let me say one of the things about tempo is in the same way that a lot of people don't appreciate um, that a bad piece ruins your position, it's and that the reason they don't appreciate it is they haven't had opponents punish them for that. Similarly with time, I feel like people haven't had somebody really stomp on them for losing a tempo. And this position, again, I didn't look at it with the computer or anything, but this position suggests that White's crimes are big enough now that he should start thinking about uh, the big one. And um, that means to open up the position. And in general, when you play this way, that's going to be the very scary thing. When you play, when I say this way, I mean without time. Now, f3 is in itself not a bad move, but we have to acknowledge we're giving away some time. So... Um, I felt uh, here that black should either be looking at some kind of e6, d5 break or an f5 break. In any case, here we go. Queen, knight e5, b3. Oh, you're killing me, Seychess. You're killing me, buddy. You're killing me. <laughs> you're killing me here. And you, it's, I feel like, right, if, if you had this, if you had it in your head that it's wrong to give away time, you just play knight d4 and you don't even think about it. Of course the knight has to go there. Are we sad that we lost the tempo earlier? Yeah, but we're losing more time with b3. And I think sometimes it's, this is an example where chess is being made too complicated. You know, when you look at super GM games, you'll see positions where they give away a tempo and then you feel like you could do it too. But this is where things should, uh, the crimes are too strong now and, and white should be looking to get wasted. Uh, again, e6, d5 suggests itself. Knight h5, probably okay. Rook c1, mm, I don't feel good about rook c1, say chess. I want you to do something like queen d2. It's not clear that the rook on c1 is that amazing. e6. Now, a little bit black, I want to say, is mixing plans. I feel like to punish you, he either needed to go leave the knight on f f6 and play e6, d5, and just say, let's rip it open, and I know I'm going to be better. Or, at this point, to play f5 and uh, get a very dynamic position where the challenge for white is just that his development is so terrible, right? Okay, so um, e6, knight g3. Now, I kind of sort of like this move, but I, I do want to stress something that when you play this way, the thing that you should realize it's hard about the position to play is that your advantage lies in space. And so when you trade pieces, uh, you are going to be fixing that space problem of your opponent. Space doesn't mean anything really without the pieces. So um, I think your opponent was scared to open the h-file. I don't think the h-file is actually going to do anything for you here, though. And um, so I'm just going to guess that queen d2 feels more right to me here than knight g3. If actually, you wrote that. But the reason is that after knight g3, uh, you know, the, the guy has a multitude of moves here. And just taking on g3, if nothing else, and he's got a great position. So, queen h4. I, I Probably something better than queen g5, but here we go. f4. I wasn't thrilled about f4 either. Because you're behind in time, and f4 creates uh, the possibility, at least, for heavy drama. Um, so... Bishop e2 comes to mind, and I'm not sure you're actually worse anymore after bishop e2. 
Uh, Black has his own problem on c8. He's kind of dilly-dallied all over the place on the king side. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing. And at some point, you're going to threaten f4. So, f4, snip. Now, where this is going to be an interesting position, but I didn't understand knight g4. The, the computer might have something, but to me, it's just a simple case where if we somehow win that dark square bishop, it's such a big deal that even if we lost a pawn or something, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. That's a big that's a big bishop, you know. Big bishop where your dark squares will really be hammered for the rest of the game. Okay. So Queen D one, Knight D one. You liked Rook D one better. And the nice thing about Rook D one I like about it is you are basically, you know saying black can play knight takes c4 if he wants and uh, I don't care then about you know bishop takes c3 check and stuff because he's going to be mobilizing all my stuff and that's absolutely right and so knight d1 I like that you didn't give him the the bishop passive and weird now so again like I said at the beginning of this end game thing where I was talking about um People play the end game incredibly badly. Rook d8, no one knows what it's doing over there. And now you're going to get a little space. You're going to give a little pin. Bishop d3, arguably knight f2, but okay. Knight d7, castles. Uh, I wanted to scream at you on this one too, St. Jess. So, uh, this mistake of castles has everything to do with time. Uh, your king is a beautiful fighting piece, and just looking at this position, I'm not immediately sure where the guy should go, but honestly, you don't have to decide on this move either. You could play like knight, just as a first thought, like say knight e3, doesn't look bad. I'm sure you've got other moves too, knight f2. You can also move the king. In any case, with castles, you've just undeveloped the king. He will be needed in the center later. Knight c5, bishop b1, b6. All right. Knight c3, and now one of the biggest chess crimes I think I've ever seen. Bishop takes c3. Oh, man. Oh, man. Say chess. This is the opponent you need to beat every single time. You need to beat this guy every single time. Now, let me just say something about openings. I know I started with openings. But if we go back, a little bit earlier, right? If we go back to the beginning of the game, this guy, this guy was playing like heavy, heavy theory, right? He was playing the heavy theory. Where, let's go all the way back, in fact. The guy knows that c5 is like the most dynamic and interesting move here. He's been doing like the chessable course and all kinds of other stuff. He's like on it, man. He knows about that pawn sacrifice and that little chessable course. He's like gone through it a bunch of times. And the sad thing is that uh, he doesn't understand chess yet. Now, that's not to say it's a bad thing. He doesn't understand chess yet. It's just that, my God, you're playing like super GM theory. This came out in like the 1990s. People understood all of a sudden that this C5 thing was amazing. And... Uh, I mean, that's great that you get it. But later, you're going to play a move like bishop takes c3 and break my heart. All right, here we go. So, no one understands a lot of these moves. And like I said, the end game here often leaves a lot to be desired. Bishop c3, oh my God. And e5, I like this move. I thought about this for a while. Now, I've been, I've been you know... Hurting you. <laughs> I've been criticizing you, say chess. But I did like e5 a lot. Um, if your king were on e2, I definitely kind of want you to play king e3. But what I like about e5 is that you are making sure, basically, that your unopposed bishop is going to be a very angry man. And so I like that a lot. Um, and I do think that he's got some real problems to solve here. D5, it's, it's, first of all, it's a hard position for the guy. 
the weird thing about d5 is that uh, if he does it with the intention of taking back with the bishop, now he's opened the c file for you, which I'm not sure he wants to do. And there's this interesting problem where the knight on c5 is kind of insecure. And what I mean by that, it's not immediately obvious, but that here, it's not clear he's getting out when he goes to e4. We're going to look at a little bit of that a little later. It's not clear it's getting out. Um, and so one interesting thought for him, I think, would have been ed. And this will allow the knight to stay here forever when you kick it with b4. Maybe also play knight e6. And of course, introduce the idea of d4 to get active play in the middle of the board. I still like white here, but I'm just saying this would have been a more dynamic way for black to play. Okay, rook c1. Yeah, and it's interesting. This position is terrible for black. Bishop b7. I, I want to say I didn't like that move either. Uh, we know why he's doing it. He's thinking, like, uh, I need to stop. I need to play rook c8 and stuff, right? And let's just look what he does to himself. Oh, man. What terrible chess, buddy. <laughs> what incredibly bad chess to be putting your knight like that. Okay, so he needed to be thinking to get ready, if he's going to play bishop d5 like this, to get ready somehow to play knight e4. And uh, I looked at this a little bit. It's definitely, definitely bad for him, but... He needs to find a way for knight e4 to uh, somehow fight. Another tricky, just he needs some kind of something. For example, maybe b5, <clears throat> b4, and then at least you can start, he can start dreaming of something like this. But in no way should he ever, <laughs> ever do this to himself. This is a guy who knew about the theory of c5 in the pawn sack. That stuff was avant-garde. <laughs> that's like that's like the real thing. Okay, so high ch chess crimes and misdemeanors here. Okay, so rook c8. It's hard to know what he should do better than that. And now you play this intuitively, just allowing the exchange of rooks, uh, which can't be that bad. All right, let's leave it at that. Bishop d3, and he goes for it. And this position, I think, is, I'm going to say, technically winning. Uh, yeah, and your first move makes sense. I don't know if you need to do it, but what I like about it is that you're stopping knight c7. Bishop b5, good, good. And the guy is totally lost. And if anything, I think the advice I could give you here is that you are obsessed about winning the pawns in the queen side. And the main thing to see about a two-bishop position like this, I think, is first of all, your king is better. So it's not just your bishops that are better. Your king is also better here. And that you want to play on both sides of the board, i.e. He's, he's got problems on both sides. And it's because of your the activity of all your pieces, not just the bishops. And remember, this is dogmatic, but the reason the two bishops are so amazing is the bishop will naturally cover more squares than the knight, but its drawback is it doesn't have the other color. With two of them, especially in an endgame like this, with an open board where, oh my god, if we start counting the squares out, it's going to get really real. Uh, right. So g4 okay uh g4 isn't bad but let's say uh that king g3 right away makes a little bit more sense to me okay there's nothing wrong with g4 a6 so c6 b5 and now the guy has made his uh let's call it his claim or whatever right his way to get out um, and you then went king g3. 
this is probably winning. Uh, but it's, it is freaking me out a little bit because I'm not sure exactly how this is all going to go down. Let's say it's okay. Knight b6, h4. And you say yourself, this is totally right, king h4. And h4, more than anything, is a loss of time. Uh, it's other things too, but it's a loss of time. And we're in a pretty dynamic situation now where his knight is going to start jumping. And you, of course, your pieces are still much better, but it's going to be, you know, partly even a psychological thing dealing with his jumpy knight. And so now we're going to begin the slide where amazingly you're going to lose this position. But one thing to bear in mind is this kind of loss has happened to more than just one person. <laughs> this has happened to many people. And it's because with h4 you're going to start to lose the light squares, right? So obvious kind of thing. If he has one thing, he should have more light squares. So knight c4. I don't know why you give it an x lamb. That's his only move. a4. Yeah. And now we got to start being worried. We got to be a little bit worried here. Bishop c5, uh, h5, and right. Now you are in trouble. And you give your next move, g5, a double question mark. And it's certainly bad, but uh, you're in trouble now. You're in trouble. Let's, give, let's look at the variation where you said it was equal. Maybe it is. To me, just first glance, it does not feel equal to me. Uh, here, here. Check to the miserable king, knight f1, bishop f2, equal. Now, if he puts his... No, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> this isn't equal. This isn't even close to equal, say chess. Look, he puts his king here, and his knight, as long as his knight's going to get out, he's winning this game. You put a knight there or something, then from there it can hop around to all over the place. Lost. This is actually the classic lost position. As we mentioned before, the, the Smyslov thing applies here too. The uh, knight excels in blockading positions, and that's definitely what he's got here. And he's got the grip on the dark squares. So, say chess, I feel like I feel like I was critical. <laughs> I, was more, I was more critical than normal. But I do want to stress that so many of the things that I talked about in this game uh, can be improved. Time being the biggest one of them. And I feel like when you look back at all the mistakes, like h4, bishop d4, b3, rook c1, uh, knight d1, castles, they were all fundamentally mistakes of time. 